Hey guys, welcome to Adam Does Real Estate. We're with Graham Barlow here today. He's from Mobile Magic, and today he's going to school us on mobile home loans. Yeah, yeah. So definitely stay tuned for that. I'm going to have his contact information below, and he's also a dealer. So uh, feel free to reach out to him. All right, thanks. All right, okay, guys, you guys yes. ready? Yes. All right, we're going to go around stuff you covered today. You know, for this is a, I'm, I was just talking about, this is a great problem to have. Everybody's out here, pretty soon it's all filled out. We still probably have a couple more agents that are still on their way. But uh, today I wanted to present, uh, I've used his dad in the past and for mobile homes, you obviously know it's different type of financing. So yeah. um, you can't use a regular loan, right, right Cindy? Nope. Yeah. Yeah, me. <laughs> so, we're going to but for manufactured homes or mobile homes, it's a certain type of loan, and you need an expert in that area to kind of guide you through that. Because yes. I always have questions about, you know, we get these leads that come across, right? They're looking for in the 200 range, and um, but it's they're looking for a mobile home, you know, because it's affordability. Um, a lot of times, and also too, they got to make sure they they qualify for the, the space rent and stuff like that, but. Graham. <laughs> he still wants to call you Magic Mike. You got whatever you Hey, good morning. Come on in. You're just in time. Hi, good morning. Come on in. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, before we start, okay, we, I just want to say a special birthday to Ada. Okay. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. So, you know, I believe mobile homes in this area are the last affordable homes in the Bay Area. Um, for people that are working class, you know, a lot of times it's the first step or a last step for individuals. Um, a lot of people don't want like, maintenance and, you know, of course there's a space around where you get all that. But uh, I'm here representing Mobile Magic, my dad's company. I've been uh, working with them for, we created in 2000 and I've uh, been working all this computer and then I went to college to not work for him and then I graduated in 2000. 11 when the job market crashed, and I was like, Dad, I'm coming to work for you. And so, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, so, you know, what, what's my goal here today? You know, what, what is my goal? You know, um, well, it's very simple, actually. Um, I want to provide you with uh, the comprehensive knowledge about mobile homes in, in, a, in a big sense and be able to answer your questions so that you can be more confident in understanding of these things, so that you can serve your clients better, all right? So that you can sell more of these and sell them faster and more efficiently. In the end result, you can make more money, right? And that's what we always want to do, right? We always have to do this is to make more money. But that's not always the end goal. It's always a serve, in my opinion. But So how I'm going to do this is a quick outline. I'm going to define and clarify the terms mobile, manufactured, modular, provide financing facts, introduce mobile magic, my dad's company, uh, talk a little bit about the loans themselves. Um, I'm also going to help uh, if you guys are representing buyers and sellers in this industry. It's a little bit different. I'm going to, uh, in my four years of being a dealer, I can just I'll just line you with what I've been finding. Um, I'm going to interpret dealer and re realtor relationships because uh, that's one thing that's not known here in the north of Northern California. Um, and um, also, I'm going to introduce governing entities of these personal property homes, like who's in charge. All right. So, all three terms: mobile, manufactured, modular. They're all describing what? A prefabricated home, right? It's something that was built in, in, in some warehouse and then brought to the site and erected or married or whatever you want to call it, right? So there's some mobile and manufactured are pretty much very similar, okay? They're both personal property, all right? They're both, uh, they're both movable, all right? They're, uh, they're built in one location, shipped with axes, axes attached, uh, axles, excuse me, on the bottom. Um, they're sold with appliances. They're considered like turnkey, as you can see there. Um, and then they're one single piece or two pieces or three pieces, and they're married together on the site, put on a temporary foundation. On back in the old days, there were some um, their uh, metal or concrete cones. Then they also had the twist uh, Titan uh, leveling system, and now I use cinder blocks. A lot safer during earthquakes, and um, you know that way, when if it does fall off, it's not going to be have a big stake coming through coming through the floor. All right, these homes are built, in my opinion, better and stronger than today, and I'm talking today, than residential homes. I think if you put a majority of residential homes on a, 
on an axle and drove it down the road, I don't think it'd make it 300, 300 miles like these do, <laughs> let alone without drywall cracking, right? I mean, so, I mean, uh, the homes I sell, I mean, they were the first to put in drywalls back in the 80s, and uh, nowadays, all the products used for manufacturing homes are actually typical residential home products. Back in the day, they always tried to make them lightweight, all these special doodads and doohickeys, and, you know, make, make it so they can easily marry back together. In fact, uh, I can tell you the history about it, but that's kind of important, yeah. So also, I'm also going to try to make this fun interactive. If you guys have any questions or you want to stop me, I'm, I'll be asking you questions throughout this presentation. Um, but uh, I do have, I, I got some questions at the end, as you can see on your paper, but um, I'm going to ask you. And uh, I got some, I, some not only, I got some ballpoint, uh, let's see, um, black ink stylus pens. To get out the other day, where we get Sanchez right now, right? Ooh. So I know, but it's gonna be, and, that, and they're adorned with the Mobile Magic's logo. So, <laughs> oh, thank all right. You. <laughs> I know. I, I have enough, I think. All right. So, what's the passing grade? Uh, <laughs> D, D gets degrees, I think, nowadays, right? Unless you get an upper division, I guess. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so what's different about mobile and manufactured homes? Well, um, really it comes down to when it was the, the conforming code that it was put into, actually. All right, so before June, July 15, 1976, a mobile home could be built any way you wanted. There was no guidelines, all right? And really the ones we see in the, in the parks today were the ones that were built well, the ones that were built strong, the ones that were actually, you know, with, with quality products. A lot of the older ones that were just, just, just that would be great, because you can, just like a mobile, many, many mobile home, like a car, you can get your Kia, you can get your Rolls Royce, right? They still have, they're still like that kind of, um, you know, uh, product lines for all kinds of mobile homes. So, I mean, I pulled the, I just, well, I was about to rip out in 1967. And I mean, this thing without being maintained for 20 years, a little bit previous on no roofing, no nothing. I mean, this thing was solid. No, no leaks, great roof, great products, copper piping. I mean, it was tough for me to want to pull it out. But I mean, so it all depends on who makes it, right? What kind of, what kind of brand it was, but but, but an effective uh, July 15th, well, it was actually um, the National Mobile Home Construction and Safety Act of 1974 that implemented the HUD, Housing and Urban Development Guidelines. Now that became, they, so they said, okay, that passed on June, uh, January 1st, the uh, Mobile Home Safety in 74. So we're gonna give the manufacturers a year and a half, or, uh, two and a half years to tool their manufacturing plans to be able to conform to the new standards of mobile homes. So July 15th, any home bought or sold after that date, 1976, became a manufacturing home because they were now conforming to the federal code. And what's funny, I love this fact, the only building code on a federal standard is the Mobile Home Safety Act, all right, of 1974. Other than that, who's left up to? Who are the codes left up to? Cities. Cities, cities counties, yeah. states, right? They have their basics, right? But you're right, most of the counties and cities. That's who holds the title, that's who holds the deed, right? That's where you gotta go get the prelim and whatnot. So, uh, what's a modular home? Hmm. So we got mobile manufacturer, modular. Well, modular, a lot of times they're designed, sold all in the same warehouse. A lot of times they're shipped in a million pieces and they wreck it on site. In fact, the biggest buyer of modular homes is the government because they're really expensive, but they can, they can really airdrop an entire, yeah, I'm so sorry, there you go. They can airdrop entire cities. There we go. Um, overnight, and then you wreck uh, you know whole towns in a few few weeks because they're already all bought together. Now they're more expensive. But uh, what makes a modular home in the state of California is that it is, doesn't have to actually adhere to the federal code, although most of them do anyways. But they it have to adhere to where they're going to be placed, the county, the city, those codes, because they're going to be put modular homes are going to be put on property that's it's going to get attached. Too. Okay, so that's what makes it's a modular home, right? Um, you know, we saw we saw blue homes here. I don't know if you guys were know about blue homes in Mare Island. Yes, they're a big modular, you know, green, but they were expensive as heck. I don't know if you looked at it. I mean, we're really talking. Move a wall. Yep. You just change that. Uh, it's like say this is there. You inside. can move it, the inside of the wall. You can move the kitchen even bigger or whatever. Yeah. I can do the same thing with manufacturing homes, believe it or not. So the same homes that I sell. I have clients all the time rearranging their house and moving walls here, moving walls here, and it costs money. But you know what's funny is I always say, okay, well, you know, these guys have only got you know uh, 50 plus years of experience designing homes and actual functionality. And if you want to do what you want, it's fine. But you know, it looks good on paper sometimes. And when you go and step in, it's like this doesn't look right. You know, so a lot of times it looks good on paper, and they think that oh, I'm gonna make a bigger room here. But a lot of times it's gonna 
it, it just I, I trust sometimes I trust the the main the people that have been building for a while, right? But yeah, but I turn a lot of uh, third bedrooms into dens with you know farm doors and or you know whatnot. But uh, yeah, I can move any wall. I can make them longer. I can make them, I can make them wider, longer, bigger uh, decks, whatever. It, it's pretty amazing. So uh, you know now that I've kind of talked mobile manufacturing modular, let's talk about the financing, right? So what does a what does financing for a personal property? So the two things about mobile manufacturing that we want to make clear. They are personal property, right? You're not getting the land. That's why you can't do the loans. That's why most people aren't going to offer the loans because what makes personal property? We'll get there. It's uh, you know, it's something you can move. Yeah, that and it's yeah, exactly. It is a move. That's a move. Mm -hmm. It's also it's like a car. It's like a boat, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so what determines the interest rate on manufactured homes? Everyone's always like, oh, what's the rate today? I'm like, oh, let me look at my rate sheet that hasn't changed in six months, you know, because um, my rates don't change every day, right? They're actually, there's only, the financing institutions divide, derive their own um, interest rates by a lot of different factors. Uh, we don't need to get into that, but what determines your, the interest rate for borrowers is, of course, their credit score, right? How much they have down and the actual personal property will be lending on, right? So, because a nineteen a two thousand and twenty home is not going to get the same loan as a nineteen sixty seven, it just there, there's not many options out there for the older homes, especially ones built before the rules, right? Um, so, what determines the down payment? Well, it's kind of the same idea, but really the debt to income ratio, um, and also the home itself. Um, now, the loan term, other than you choosing in a shorter term, really the terms that I, I dictate what loan I can offer is the actual personal property itself, you know, the 1967, the best loans in the industry are only 15 year loans. These homes were a bit manufactured in those uh, days. That they're supposed to be moved as on farmland. And really manufactured home parks in a way were actually a slip around the residential home codes. Because what people, I know what happened in Napa, was there's a man named Jack Newell came around and he was wanting to build, he had a whole subdivision wanting to build in Napa County. Well, Napa County says, no, nope, we're not building. We've reached our met limit for this uh, county. We're not going to put the homes there. You we got shot down. So we just spent a couple, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars building plans, make a code, and we got shot down. So they come back a year later. He says, you know what? I want to build an RV park, right? So what did that do? So, oh, that's going to bring people in to visit Napa. That's going to change our economy. It's a commercial property. And so that's how a lot of these parks started was they thought they were just going to be temporary individuals coming and staying and being able to generate revenue for the city. So they approved them a lot easier. Commercial properties get easier to get approved, right? So back in those days, all these were put in and they're thinking, well, wait a minute. Now they're seeing, and this was like early 60s, late 60s, early 70s, they're like realizing these homes aren't moving. People are not <laughs> leaving where they're placing these homes. So what happened? The government came in and says, you know what? You know what? I have people living on our, in our state, in our county, that are, they own a home and they're not getting taxed for it. They are not paying property tax. So what's going to happen? They enacted, we'll get to the pro property tax in 1980 and newer. All right? Because they weren't getting their money. Um, but scores on credit. I can do them below 620 if they have a lot of down. All right, and depending on the situation, um, but um, but 700, 660 or better, more options, 700 to get the best loan in the industry. All right, um, so what like we, right, of course, <laughs> same difference, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all is uh, relative, that's for sure. But, um, so what is, why is financing different? Well, uh, real property, we said earlier, you get the home, the land, what, don't you get like 50 feet of airspace when you buy a home? I heard something like that. Uh, Get all the airspace. Yeah. Well, I'm saying directly above the house, 50 feet oh. is you own. I'm pretty sure. I, I, yeah, I'm it does sure. go up to a certain point. Yeah, exactly. I can't remember yeah. exactly how much. So. I mean, I'd be charging planes to fly over me, you know. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, they're the best the best tip there on the real property is, you said it, immovable, right? So that's why when you put a regular home on the land, it's got a foundation, it's not moving anywhere. That's the way it becomes a part of the real property, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's real estate, right? But a mobile and a park, we're going to this. Timber money is going to move. All right, so let's talk about loan similarities between these and regular homes, right? Well, I thought long and hard, and I was like, you know what? There's not too many. So here's the ones I got. I think you uh, have some questions on that. But um, they're all governed by the CFPB. But what's funny is um, when the Dodd-Frank Act passed in 2014, um, we can knock this question out right now. This is one of the questions I was going to ask. It's not listed. That is, is, is good for a pen, all right? <laughs> so, what does the term buyer beware mean, according to a court? I have to come 
Very good. In short, what that means is you are responsible to prove in the court of law oh. that you can repay the loan. You have to, so very similar to that. So it'd be up until January 1st, 2016, before that time, and this is just like in car loans, in credit cards, and everything you deal with other than a real property in, uh, rather than a um, uh, dwelling uh, loan, a um, where you live, I am trying to, whatever, but other than where you live, there's I mean, no yeah. loans that are, the, that are covered where in the Dodd-Frank Act, after we had the huge crash of 2008, you came and Obama came and we had the Dodd-Frank Act 2018, which created the CFPB, Consumer Financial, Financial Protection Bureau, which looked over people like me, the mortgage brokers. They defined predatory loans, they defined all kinds of different terms, but what they didn't do is they didn't set a firm like understanding of you know, we, the ability to repay the loan. Because now the ability to repay the loan before up until that time, it, it was up to you to be able to prove in the court of law that you can be able to afford the loan you required, right? So that's what buyer beware means, right? Beware that you might, you might get something that you might be able to handle. And, you know, that's what was happening a lot. So, but up until 2000, and then when it was enacted in 2016, um, it all of a sudden became lender beware. Why? Because now it's the lender's responsibility to prove in the court of law that the, 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 per, the borrower taking your loan has the ability to repay the loan up until the, the has the ability to repay at the time of consummation. Right. All right, so that's why we see all these loans constricting. We saw a lot of loans where when it was uh, when the 2016, all of a sudden there was, weren't products anywhere. And what happened was the biggest lender in mobile homes, they also on that same act, the lobbyists saw it was a brilliant idea to conform mobile homes to real property standards. And so what happened? The biggest lender in the industry over you know 20, I think like 20 million dollars a month almost in million bucks home loans, and the average is like 60 grand pulled out of the industry. Well, what happened? What did that do? It really hurt our economy, right? There was when when, when the middleman's not growing, what's happening, right? The, the richer getting richer, the poorer getting poorer. So what happened was the federal government actually came back. It was actually so this company's owned by Warren Buffett. Within a year, you um, the government, the CFPB, and the and the enacting government came back to Warren Buffett. Asking, hey, what is it going to what is it going to take to bring you back in the industry? All right, so that's why. And I don't know if you heard them. Twenty first mortgage. All right, Warren Buffett. They also own some mobile homes. Okay, that's they, they actually didn't fire anybody. They reallocated their employees toward asset, re uh, asset uh, retention, and then they went out of the industry for a year. And then um, once they came back, now their now their lawyers are helping lobby with the laws because it just there's no way we can conform to the industry standards of real property homes because there's a lot more risk, right? Real homes, they can't get up and run away, right? <laughs> so uh, that's just the beginning of it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I had a video of a guy breaking his whole rear end out, you know, pulling the mobile home, but I didn't put it on my side. It was pretty funny. All right, so what's the differences of real property and personal property? So we can always say mobile homes, manufactured homes, all these homes that you're talking about, like these, we, I want to redefine the term. We shouldn't say mobile. We should say personal property homes. Personal. Yeah, they're 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 yeah. not. It's not. It's they're not mobile men. Right? They could be. They could be. They're either one. Right? Depends on what year they were and what code they were conforming to. Because before the mobile homes had no code, right? Then the manufacturers have federal code, and the modular homes have, once well, again, city, county, state code, right? So what is the difference? Is a lot, man. I mean, the loan eligibility. I can't finance ten numbers, and that that can go into five minutes about why that can't happen. But basically, mobile home, personal property homes have to be typically homeowner occupied. That's what typically why is the park is requiring it. There's very few parks in the state of California that will allow you to buy manufactured personal property homes in their park and let you rent it out. Why? Because then they have no, uh, they, have, they they have no say in what's going on in their on their property, and they want to make sure that it's a safe place, right? Um, and just here, uh, I don't you need to go over all these, but um, you know, so you know, regular homes. Another thing about regular homes is they require the lender requires to have a general contractor's inspection or a pest report or certain things like that, mm -hmm. right? All I need is an appraisal. All I want to see is that the investment that I'm making is is is, is reasonable for that area, right? That's all the lenders want to see. Four hundred fifty bucks for an appraisal. Get them out there. Reports done. You know, and it's not like the real property where you guys do it. Where you put it up to a board and somebody picks it up when they want. Who knows how long it's going to take, right? Mine, I still order to the appraiser directly. All right. Um, how long does it take to last? I'm glad you asked. Okay, I probably missed that. No, no, no. no. Next slide. Okay. You're right on page. So it's actually so the typical escrow is about 30 days. 
Warren Buffett's company, they want to know what pant size you have, what car you drive, you know, they want to know everything about you. So, I mean, they want to be able to track you, they want to know where the seller is going, they want to know that, where your job was 30 years ago, they, oh, wow. and I'm just, I'm just kidding, but it's like, they, it's the amount of information they collect, and they're, they're just a number to them, so they take about 45 to 60 days, depending on how well on top of it. Like, a lot of times when I'm asking for conditions, right, because I process my own loans. When you go to a real estate company, the MLO, a person like me with my license, is all only on the phone, face to face, selling the loan. Once it's sold, they transfer it, they give it, they sell it off to the processor. I don't do that. I process my own loans. Okay, so a lot of times I'll be asking for paperwork from people. You know, let me get your um, bank statements. Well, they'll give me the odd pages. Or they'll get, you know, so it's always like, I'll even tell, if they're thorough, I got one guy today, man, I closed the loan 21 days with them. Because he was just, every time I asked, he was on top of it. It's up to the borrower, right? It's up to the yeah. borrower. But even with 21st Mortgage, there's going to be a couple of days where they just sit on it. Because they got stuff, they're, they, they're just, they're just not So uh, it really depends on, but typical, 20, 30 days. So okay? it's easy to qualify for a manufactured home? You think so, right? It's like you're borrowing less money, right? Yeah, no, no, it's not. It's a lot harder, it's a lot harder, yeah. right? It's, it's, I mean, it, it, you're like, uh, you're, there's a lot more risk involved. Think about, the thing about these loans that I'm offering at 5% down. Let's say they stop, they, they get in, I just moved in, I just rented a place in Napa with my wife and my son. As soon as we moved in, we found out, uh, I was six months later, Home Street's showing up, dropping off papers at the front door. I'm a mortgage broker. They're not looking for a refinance. As soon as I moved in, the guy stopped paying his mortgage, right? I mean, I, and then I found out, was, but that's just my personal experience, but it was sucked. I had to move out because they foreclosed on it, right? And I, um, but, so that's the thing. So let's say someone's over 5% down, closes the loan. If the lender has to go back in there, yeah. right? They got they stop paying the space rent. So now they have penalties with the space rent. They got to pay eight hundred dollars back six months, forty eight hundred bucks right there. Then they got to pay to sell it. Then they got to pay to fix it up. You know, so there's the risk is that I mean, I mean people are like, oh, I did, I'm only borrowing sixty thousand dollars. I'm like, yeah, but look what we're holding as collateral. You know, you could you could literally you could get legs and run away and never see it again, right? I mean, they, I, I've heard of people wanting to get a loan on that home and then knocking it down and putting a new one. You can't do that, right? As soon as that HCD. Um, we'll get to it, but they, as soon as the HCD sees that it's been demolished, that lender is going to be coming after you for the funds because that's what that's what that's where the collateral is at, right? So if the, the interest rates are higher. It's harder to get approved. I mean, I can't do tax identification numbers. I mean, that, you saw the list. If you want to yeah. come back, we could revisit that later. But I mean, it, they're a lot harder because it's just a um, lot more risk for the lender. Okay, um, you know, interest rates. Everybody goes, oh, "What's the interest rate today?" Well, there's a few factors, right? I went over the factors or credit score, the down payment, the home itself. I got interest rates from four to fourteen percent legally. Okay, I mean, and we're not even high cost mortgages anymore. You know, with all these terms, there's all these triggering terms that trigger certain uh, CFPB and actions that we a lot of times we don't apply to. Okay, because we're just it's just different. It's a personal property home. Um, uh, you know, so the tri triple terms, twenty years. New homes I can do up to twenty five. I've heard about a product coming out with thirty. But, um, but the, Warren Buffett's, they go up to 23 years. Um, no, 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 there's no co-signing. This is another thing you guys should all know. I should have put this on your questions. Co-signing, not allowed in manufactured homes, okay? Because why? Because whoever co-signs goes on the title of the home. Right. Whoever goes on the title of the home, the mobile home park wants to see that is moving in, right? Right. So there's just, there, there's, there's, we have a program called, it's a buy for program, meaning let's say you want to buy a house for your son. Okay, well, you're going to buy it. Um, the, the, the park's gonna require your son to go on title, so the park has to write a letter to the lender saying that they're requiring it, so that way the lender will allow him to go on title. However, um, you have to solely qualify for what your debts are right now, plus the, plus the new debt that's being added on. Okay, so, and you have to come up 20% down because it's a second home purchase, right? So, uh, so it's, I mean, you gotta stand alone. Your son has nothing to do with that loan at that point board. Now he goes on title, but at the same point, you have to be able to qualify for all your debt and the existing debt. That's another thing that's different in mobile homes. People come to me all the time, oh, you know what, Graham? I'm approved for four hundred thousand dollar loan. I can make it work, you know. I'm like, well, it's only a two hundred thousand dollar house. I'm like, okay, well, did that lender that the pre qualification uh, counted a nine hundred dollar space rent? Nine hundred dollars that can't go towards your mortgage, sure. right? Mm -hmm. So it's all relative, right? The higher the space rent, the less you're approved for, yeah. right? A lot of people think, oh my gosh, I'm approved for you know four hundred thousand dollars. I can buy a mobile home. Sorry, the ratio is too high. Because you know what? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, there's nine. That's nine hundred dollars. That's if you look at a mortgage. That's like the good rule of thumb is for every hundred dollars, it's about a hundred thousand dollar loan that you can add. All right, it's, it's, it's a rough. This, it works ninety percent of the time, right? So if somebody tells me they got four hundred fifty dollars at the door for mortgage payments, so uh, space, mortgage payment, taxes, and insurance, I'll say okay, that's forty to fifty five thousand dollar loan. Though. Right? I mean, it's, it's not exact. It's not exact science. You got to look at interest rate. It gets a lot more detailed, but you know, it's it's a good idea.
Graham, what is your DTI, your debt to income? Um, it depends on the lender, okay? But typically up to 40, uh, 45, 43. There's no front end ratio. It doesn't matter what, what's the front end ratio? Just the housing. Yes, sir. It's just housing. <laughs> you get it. Uh, He's a lender. Yeah. He's a lender. <laughs> <laughs> Then, then you need that pen. <laughs> Black ink, legal. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so front end is just housing, right? So we look at, really in mobile homes, we don't really look at that, right? Uh, we just look at back end, which is the back end is your total debt to income ratio. I call people all the time, they're like, oh, I'm going to get pre-qualified. I'm like, okay, well, before you start, do you have how much income you have a month? And what's funny is a lot of people go, you know, oh, I make $25 an hour, or 40 hours a week. Let's see, that's four weeks. I'm making $800 a week. That's, you know, uh, Let's see, uh, I mean, thirty-two dollars a month? No, actually, that's not. Yeah. Why is it? Because they're not doing forty. They're not doing their eight hundred dollars a week times fifty-two weeks a year divided by twelve, right? Then people are like, oh, there's four weeks in a month. Mm -hmm. No, there's not actually. There's some are more, some are less, right? That's why you know. That's why a lot of people want to think that way. Yeah, but it's fifty-two weeks in a year. So if you divide that by twelve, after you calculate that, mm -hmm. you'll figure out your total. You're just cutting yourself, you're selling yourself short if you just say every every four weeks. You know? All right? Um, but okay, I can go with Andrew there. A little rabbit hole. <laughs> so, what am I here to do today? Besides make you guys more money, I want to introduce my dad's company, Mole Magic. All right? So, we were founded in 2000. We've seen over 40 companies come and go in this industry. We loved it. We love watching these small credit unions come in the industry, offering these crazy low rates, these crazy down payments. The last about a year and a half, two years. Like the Redwood Credit Union, they were doing them for a while, or uh, Sonoma Valley Credit Union. They were doing them for a while, it was, it was an adjustable rate, it was all this crazy stuff going with it. And what's funny is, if a client, if we think, if a client is fitting those needs, because we know our loan products very well throughout the nation, we know the local ones, we know the state ones, if, if a client is better off with those companies, we'll refer them, you know? I, I can't tell you how many, how many how much money I've given away for, for just saying, you know what, just go down the street, Sonoma, they got a better interest rate right now, the product's crazy, just go take it, you know? It, 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 I'm not here to take advantage of everybody. That's why we're still in the industry. You know, that's why all these. I mean, we've been a mortgage broker for, since 2000. My dad came. We moved from Michigan when I was two years old. All right, for my dad to become a mortgage broker in Napa Valley. He was one of the first three in the valley. Then all of a sudden, by the 90s, there's hundreds of them. Right, and everyone's trying to scam. And he saw, saw all these people taking advantage. Of, you know, oh, they just raised 19 percent the next year. Oh, it dropped to 18. Let's refinance it. You know, like, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's what was happening. You know, <laughs> so you know, we, we were tired. He was, he was tired of all these people coming to me. Hey, let me get a mobile home loan. You know, no one. What's that? No one's gonna do it, right? So he was working for a broker, and the broker said, "Well, get this license. You gotta get your CFL license. Do it. You know, they never got it, right? And uh, so he's like, you know what? I'm gonna go get it myself. So that's mm -hmm. well, no, that's how we started. You know, he stepped out. <laughs> um, cool thing about Mobile Magic, what we do for you guys. If you guys have a listing, I'll make a personalized flyer for that listing. Okay, with a credit representative person with a credit score of 700. Um, you have it in your hand. That's what all that was. Is my, I put my dad's card attached to it. It's basically just a uh, it's a financing flyer that I'll, I'll make for your house as long as you send me the, uh, the information. You know, so that way you can include it with your breakdown. I'll, I'll refer you an agent. She's having trouble. Yeah, we all need some hands. But no, I'm happy to help her. You know, it's, what's, what's crazy is a lot of times I can't give them a loan, but the park won't approve them. So in addition to being um, uh, approved for the, uh, being a loan approved, you got to yeah. you gotta be, they got to be approved for the park, right? And the park, some parks have certain requirements. It really depends on what the park is want, their goals are, and what they're wanting to do. Sometimes they'll implement new strategies to be able to kick people out and get people to out. A lot of, lot of, lot of people are getting taken advantage of by their mobile home parks. That's okay, terrible. that's why in the seventies there was a group that banded together called the Golden State Manufacturers Homeowners League (GSMOL) that was over ninety thousand people strong. And now it's slowly dwindling because they're actually they're, they're getting more active. They're, they're basically harnessed these people that were doing all these pastures, right? Oh, we want to get re we, uh, so let's say space was five hundred bucks. We want to repave the whole the whole site, right? So everybody should pitch in twenty bucks a month in two years. We'll have enough. No, actually, that should be included in your in your monthly rent. So there's all, all kinds of stuff that happens, right? People getting kicked out. I, and being in the industry, I can't tell you how many times I've been taking advantage of for uh, being a new dealer. I've been taking advantage of for over two hundred fifty thousand dollars. By parks and, and owners, and it's, it's just incredible what they do. And I mean, I mean, it's, it's, do you want to find McCord and spend all those efforts? It's not worth it right, right now, but there will be a day where we're okay? mm -hmm. But it's, it's it's amazing how they do it. So the uh, decal number that's three consonants and four numbers, and that will identify what home they have on record. All right, we can also pre-qualify people. I said a lady yesterday, call me up, solid individual, nurse, you know, in a while. Um, 
I wrote, I wrote a prequel, I'll send it out to her later, but without even getting her loan out, you know? Or I did get her loan out. I mean, I, I filled one out over the phone with her, because I'm not gonna send a prequel later without getting an application, right? But I got the application, I looked at it, I looked at it. We don't pull people's credit. Mobile Magic, we won't pull your credit. Why? Because in this industry, people are, credits are getting slammed, all right? First off, even if I had a credit report, no lender was gonna accept that. They, they all pull their own these days. Unless you pull it on the same code, it's not gonna batch together, okay? So and on top of that, they're going from park to park to park, and they're getting, pulling what? Residency applications, mm -hmm. right? Because the park is gonna pull their credit to see if they can be approved for residential or, or, or their rent. So their credit's getting slammed every other way, so why should I pull their credit when they're not gonna accept it anyways? Right, so you know it's it's tough for me to you know I, I can I have the ability to, but it's it, it doesn't give my borrower client the advantage by doing it. So there's no point in this, right? Um, so, but what once we do have, a, let's say, really, in, in order for me to submit the loan, I have to have a home in mind. I have to have a property, right? I have to have something that's collateral. Because without that, I mean, I could I'm just shooting. Shoot, now I can't shoot you firm numbers. Right? But once I do have all of the completed application, in two days, I'll figure out which loan's best for you, and I'll tell you, you know, I'll determine that. And we'll get to it too over some terms and conditions. And so you need a lot more patience. You know, realtors are all the time calling me up. You know, where is this going? What's going on? I'm like, well, it's a lot more fluid relationship than a real property home, and a lot of people don't understand that. You know, you're dealing with a lot more moving parts. You're dealing with the park. You're dealing with these lenders that can do what they want. I mean, you know, people are always like, oh, 30 days, I want to get done 30 days. You know, it's like, well, I'm going to do my best, but you know, I can't promise that. You know, I mean, it, it really, I mean, if the borrower is, it, it's, it, it's taking time getting you all the information. Yeah, I had another guy just the other day, two weeks. I sent him out a 22 page pre funding package. Two, two weeks took to get back to me. I'm like, oh, we're gonna yeah. so close on 21st? I'm like, it's the 18th. No, like, like you know, I, that's not even get reviewed by that. Yeah. Don't you, you know? love it when they want to go on vacation? Oh, every, I can't tell you how many times I close homes or they're like, yesterday I got a guy called, oh, this home's not closed. He's, he's going off to Mexico for a month. Yeah. What? Like you're leaving this? Living in the you're, you're gonna leave the country before you buy a home, or yeah. right after you buy a home? Like I don't understand that. That's, you, you, don't we see it? Why do we see it all the time? It's, I don't get it's it. insane. It is. It is insane. I, I don't mind chasing them around the states where I can get an actual, uh, you know, a mobile uh, um, notary. Right. But when I'm chasing them around the country, I can't do that. Yeah. Service. <laughs> um, so with you guys, my broker and realtor services, right? I'll provide. You can call me. Hey, I got a client. You know, let me know how it goes. Or text me, email me, make sure I'm, I'm communicating with you. Because a lot of times. I can't tell you how many people just think, you know, I'm gonna get back to them when uh, they don't give me the right information. Just make sure I'm on top of it. Right now, we're, we're in the middle of this like, transition period of integrating my, my old ways to new ways. So we're in the middle of some flux right now. My dad's getting ready, he's 70 years old, he's trying to retire, and I'm trying to take it over, but you know, we're not implementing any changes. And, you know, old dog, new tricks, works all the time, right? So, um, you know, but like I said, the flyers, and uh, another cool thing is if you see the matrix on the right, I don't know if it's too small. Oh. So there's a, a loan app, there's that, what you got, and then I'll run a matrix, right? So this is important because that way $400 space rent, $1,000 space rent, you know about what size of the loan you follow. Mm -hmm. And that'll give you like with the down payment and everything like that, so that way you know what to shop for, right? Um, so what's different about representing mobile homes as opposed to real property, or personal property homes as opposed to real property homes? Um, well, you gotta figure out, you know, what's that park law? First, you know, you know we know there's a state law, but what's the park saying? I mean. How, you know, is what if what if I want to hold on? I didn't went to a uh, park the other day. They wouldn't let me have an open house. I was like, "Are you kidding me? Like, how, they won't let me hold an open house? Like, you know? Oh no, we don't want the extra traffic. I'm like, okay, so you got to make sure you know where the signage. You know, there are rules. Where do you want them? Where do you want to park? Can you park in the street? Can you not park in the street? You know, these are things that when you're getting a client, you gotta you gotta ask. And, uh, it's always disclosed, disclosed, disclosed. But if you don't know, you can't disclose. So it's a fine line to balance sometimes, depending on uh, what you feel. Um, but there's some parks I just, I don't want to know the management, some parks I do, right? Because um, I represent buyers and sellers in these homes all the time. And, uh, I know the parks down here, they're pretty interesting. Um, the biggest thing you can ask, you're, if you're representing a client selling your home, what's the space rent going to be for the new buyer? I had a home in American Canyon I put in, when I bought it, it was 500 dollars space rent, put a new home in, new management came in, took over the park. That new home space rent came up with $800. And the only reason why they can do that was because I was under a, um, uh, I'm not under applicable mobile home residency law because I'm a dealer. So I don't fall under the protected class. So because I'm not the protected class, okay, um, I, this is one thing I learned is being a dealer. Tough lesson. Because I, I don't sign a residential, I don't, I don't sign a lease agreement with them, right? I'm not moving into the home. I sign a storage agreement with them. 
and that's why I wasn't protected. So, but they, so I didn't know that there were, I didn't get it on paper before I started the project. But what does that do? When the space rent jumps up, what does that do to the value of the home? Takes it down because you're equal. Yeah, absolutely. The higher the space rent, the less homes are worth. Mm -hmm. Look at there's a park in Marin. I'm not gonna, it, but some of the space rents go for $1,900 a month. Six, six, those homes are still selling for $250,000, $300,000. Then, one, uh, about 30% of the park has a space rent of $900. Mm -hmm. I can get in the reason for that. I have Sam Zell, billionaire, owns the park. He owns half the park. He owns 30% of the park, which is using as much rentals, so running them for $5,000 a month, whatever it was. Then he wanted to sell them. We're going to sell them. Oh, the space rent's two, $3,000. Then there's a dispute. I couldn't loan in the park for six years because of, because of the lawsuit. Um, and uh, to make a long story short, some of the, so the ones that have a $900 space rent, those homes are $400,000. Yeah. The space ones with $1,900, they're worth like 200, 250. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard crazy things. People sell them for three, but it's, what are they? What, what is a home really worth? What somebody is willing to pay for it. Amen. Right? We know that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Kenny. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's where that's the truth, though. Yeah. yeah. Do you know Delta Vista and Antioch? Uh, I, I, yeah. oh, I don't want to talk to. I don't want to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> no, they, I do. They got burned. Yeah. So I before they sold to the new owners, those so <laughs> hey. you had control. Yeah, that's an interesting part. You know, they didn't have water rights for a long time. You gotta go. No, 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 you're on camera. I just yeah. wanted to say Oh yeah, no, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I'm not gonna say anything that's not <laughs> the truth. Hurts. No, no, this is the that's not the truth. I was in contract to buy I, I had to call your dad about that one. Yeah. That was my client. We couldn't lend in there for years. Yeah. We couldn't lend in there for years. When the water screw was all screwed up. No loan lenders are going to go in there with the space rents like that. That's crazy, right? And then also another thing that lenders won't do is if it's a co-op. What's it, you guys ever know what the definition of co-op is? Okay, it's basically when I love it. Own the land. It's the same lease land. So I've talked to the lawyer that wrote the majority of the co-op agreements with these parks. What they do is they buy out the current owner of the park and they create what's called a co-op. Well, what it is you don't own any of the land. What do you own? You own nothing tangible. You own a share of the an organization yeah. of the, of the uh, well, a share of the so every everyone in that park is a, is a member of the of that organization right so you all have a share in the organization it's not like you own land it's not like you own, all you own is a theoretical which what it, what it does help is it helps decrease space rent over the uh, over the longevity time we have one up in um, the same guy that wrote the one in. Um, um, uh, American Canyon is called uh, Marin. Uh, no, no, um, what was more, uh, Marine, 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 um, World Marine, World Marine. Uh, right, and space rents have not increased for like 50, for like yeah, 15 years. Well, why? Because the lawyer that wrote the agreement they made it a co-op, and basically they made it so that way. Sure, when you, in order to buy into that agreement, you have to spend 50, when you first opened it was fifty thousand dollars to buy a share. Right now that share is selling for thirty thousand dollars. Why? Because the values of the home get up. So even though it's nothing tangible, and loan, letters won't go in there. Because why? When you sign those agreements with the, when you sign up for the rent that part, you're saying in that agreement that that co-op gets first priority if you lose the house. So all of a sudden the lender that's in first position, when they have to, when they see that agreement <coughs> presented them after they foreclose, they're not in first position. The co-op is. Right. So who's going to go in there and touch that? They don't have no power in there, and they're in their collateralization. There's, there's a co-op in over in Richmond area too. There's a. Mm -hmm. They can sell the building, everything, but they don't own the land. Yeah, that's yeah. the same way. You, you, own a, you own a share. Yeah. You own an idea. All, yeah, because I was reading the thing and I was like, oh, these are shares. Yes. Yeah, and I know the lawyer that wrote majority of them. He wrote 23 of them in, in, um, in a, a really big place, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz has the most of them. That's where he lives. That's where he resides. Really great guy. He, I was trying to uh, I was trying to alter it. Yeah. It's a personal property. So I, so this is the last thing I want to say. ILT and LPT, when you look at the tax step on the registration, there's a, there's a, there's a card right here. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, Basically, property tax. So ILT, ta there's a tax type on, on title. Yeah. ILT or LPD. ILT is in lieu tax. Those are homes before 1980 that are pay a one-time sales tax, and then they pay a registration, which is like 75 bucks a year. If that was a new development. Now, if you now at that time, so those are 70 homes, in that, maybe 70 and older, 1980 and newer are on local property tax rolls, right? So every year you're paying 700 whatever it is, right? whatever it is a month. But the way they determine is the National Association. Of uh, do this administration to lose value and yeah, assessing towards that. So it's a decline, de depreciating asset. So your taxes are going down, but it's still a lot more than registering. I call it the golden age of mobile homes, built with rules and with before taxes. 
76, 77, 78. Okay, wait a minute. Wait. All right. Back up to that lap. So what you're saying is they're paying both taxes. No. So, no, no. no? So they're either one or the other. Oh, okay. They're either Sorry. one or the other. 79 or ILT. Okay. Unless they've been rolled over. A lot, what I saw all the time was, because really, when you time you transfer it, you can, you can actually transfer to local property tax rolls. Uh -huh. What it does is, it saves them like $400 on the close, right? Because the sales tax is pretty expensive. You know, $1,200 sales tax. But, you know, um, you know, so the sales tax is $1,200. If we sold over local property tax, it's only like $650 right now. So we save them, what, $550 on the close of the transaction? Yeah, but that $650 is back next year. Opposed to registration where it's only 700 bucks a year. It's basically what it's doing is it's transferring the, the responsibility of the title from the county to from the state. ILT is the Housing and Community Development regulates that, right? Okay. Too much to talk. Yeah. Okay, so that's what it does. So don't do it. Like I said, don't, you know, the time closed, don't think you're saving your clients money by rolling it over to the local property tax. You're not, okay? Um, so representing, yeah, we're right there. I'm the back one. Oops. Uh, last thing, truth. You know, so I'm a dealer. Can I work with you guys as realtors and brokers? Yes, yes. we can work together. In fact, I make it, I've, I've, I've cost big firms thousands of dollars interpreting what I'm about to tell you. Like the law that I'm about to tell you, I've cost them thousands of dollars. Big, big, big companies. Defined, defined by the housing bulletin 12204, and mobile home residence law. Dealer, let's say you're representing a, 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 buy, a seller, I'm representing a buyer. We come together on the price, we come together on the terms. All right, you have your paperwork, I have mine. Okay, the law states that even, let's say, let's say, you, let's say we, we get a close. Two years later, your seller wants to sue you because you didn't do a good job. They can't, they sue me. I'm the one responsible for the transaction. I'm the dealer, I'm the, I'm the professional in, the, in that field because it's personal property. Your liability just got removed entirely if I get involved. I know some some realtors and brokers, they love to see me when I walk up because I do all the paperwork for them, they collect the same amount of money, right? <laughs> they, they, because they, whatever they negotiated with the, with the seller, they, they are still entitled to. But see, brokers can only pay brokers. Me as a dealer, I can pick who I want, other than the park and the management stuff, right? Because that's coercion, right? That's, that's steering. But I can pay anybody for a referral, all right? As long as it's not somebody that is associated with ownership of the park or management. So the result is, because all the responsibility falls on me, you should be happy to see me if I walk in with a client. Because, I mean, I still want you to do your duties of your, your responsibility. I don't want you to look any safe. I want you to save all your face you can. And it's, it's, I'm just telling you, it's, it, that's the law. And it doesn't mean that you need to compromise your um, integrity. But it, it's, it's a good thing to do to, to be able to work with them. And you can still do our paperwork. Just sign both. Just sign both. I, I, I mean, I, it's so silly how many realtors I fight with because I want them to sign my paperwork and we'll sign theirs. And really, theirs has no weight other than to their broker of record that's thinking it does. All right, so here's the a, here's a MRL, here's the code. And when we do this, always sign up, set up an irrevocable assignment of referral fee. I always offer it for whatever you're entitled to. I had a lady, she was making 25 grand, I made 12, 2,000 bucks. But I, re, so I, I made the 27 and I gave her the 25, right? So basically, it was all came out of escrow, but basically I, it was, it was, that was the referral fee. I made the two for the buyer. So who is the governing body? We're gonna know this, Housing Community Development, HDD, right? They're in Sacramento, Los Angeles. That's one licensed by Housing and Community Development. All right. Uh, it's the only government agency that I am proud to say <laughs> I work with. God bless you. Okay. Thank you. I'm not yeah. joking. God bless you. Yeah. Thank you. They actually they pick up their phone calls. They know their stuff. They're, they have answers. They're there to help. I can't tell you when I got taken advantage of. They were the, uh, eight guys sitting down there, look at helping me, uh, working with me. I walk in HDD in Sacramento. They know me by my first name. It's, they're an awesome, awesome organization. I'm very proud. It's like even though it's like Department of Vehicles. What is, what is it? What is the Department of Vehicles in California? Any car that's on the road, they said the, they basically tell you if it's okay to be on the road. They give you your license to drive on the road. They t tell you your taxes. They hold the registration. They do all the yada yada yada. Right? What's their um? What's their what's their mission statement? We proudly serve the public by licensing drivers, registering vehicles, securing identities, and regulating the motor vehicle industry. Right? Think of the HDD as that. So here's theirs. HDD further protects consumers by enforcing regulations for those built who build and sell manufactured homes. The building standards, HCD protects the health and safety of Californians by enforcing standards of housing and construction, maintenance of farm housing workers, housing and uh, manufactured homes, factory built homes. So they're basically just walking um, inspections, buying the homes and the homes I sell. All right. Um, so this is what, so another thing when you go to sell a house, always look for this, this is the pink slip. I think about a pink slip of a car. It's brown, okay, it's got brown. That's the original title, all right? For the house, right? You can literally transfer it by flipping it over and, and transferring it that way. 
I mean, a lot of times we go through escrow because there's loans, right? And the lender ain't gonna just do it, you know, let's go to HCD and write down my name on there. No, because we can actually go to HCD, I do it all the time. I can't, when I buy my cheap homes for a couple grand or a thousand grand, I'm gonna pull it out, put in. I help people. If people are stuck up, I had a lady who make $24 a month, straight income, she had $1,900 a month rent, she was living on $200 a month, poor lady. I, I went here and paid off all her debt, I gave her $10,000, like uh, $8,000 to live, okay? And I bought her house from her. She's now living debt free in a retirement community, right? Um, and I helped her, I bought her house. It was all, that's the beautiful thing about loans. I can help people that have no idea that, they, that, they're, that there's a tear out, piece of crap home. The home is worth, blew the value on a lot, 5,000 bucks, if that, if that. It's not even worth it the cost to move it, okay? So, um, you know, anyways. Question. Yeah. The um, H, what, what was it? The HCD. Yeah, HCD. Do you have information on how to contact them? Yeah, just go on, uh, on the peninsula. HCD.ca.gov. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, okay. it's really easy. I mean, okay. just Google HCD uh, in California. I mean, they're, they're, you, they, they'll they break it down to every division you want to go. It's cool. Now the division is Sacramento. I, I recommend going there, honestly, even though it's. Is uh, it in Sacramento? It is in Sacramento. I know it's worth the, it's worth the drive, though, because you get stuff taken care of. All right. And they'll take care of it much faster that way when you're there. Because besides, they go in a pill and you're in there. I know it's real. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So, last thing I want to introduce myself. My company is called Alpha Mania Rex Home. All right. Um, back in 2013, I, I was tired of clients coming to me, especially in Napa. Grandma, would you only buy a home? Would you only sell a home? No, I, a realtor A, they can, realtor B, uh, the dealer, whatever. Uh, tell them, you know, we're already pre-qualified clients. No one serves them. No one serves our, our working class. These are truly our working class. People in buying these family parks in our communities are our working class citizens. And I was tired of them watching them. First off, when they when the realtors are going to sell the home, they're not really trying their best, right? If the home's worth 100, they, they look at all the comps, right? And the, it's a, it markets up, right? Because these homes, they're less risk than a real property home, right? You might buy a home for $400,000, it all of a sudden depreciates. And I look at my parents, they bought an 87, right? $150,000, it's worth $750,000 now, right? You'll never see that, I mean, I mean, sure, I do sell some mobile homes from that sold for like 1,500 bucks in the 60s that are selling for that. But it's, I mean, it's just, it's, it, it, it doesn't go as much. And part of that reason is because most people selling these homes don't try as hard, right? Because they're not making as much money. Because think about it, like I, I've increased the values of almost every park in Napa County because of the homes I sold. Because I don't, because what realtors do is look at the comps and they'll lowball the heck out of them. Like I say, I, I get clients all the time that are like, you know, I, I want to get $150,000 on this house. You know, they were like, oh, you, you know, the homes are only selling for 90 in here. They're sure there's one that sold for 130, but you know what? You're, let's, just, let's just put it at what? Let's just put it at 90 and we'll get a bidding war. Oh, that sounds great. We'll get a bidding war. You know, but no, it's just because they want to flip it, right? It's another sale, another feather in the cap, another home sold by 21st March, 21st century, right? They don't really want to take their time and service these, these folks. And so, I just didn't know this. I don't know how. That's true. That's true. That's, what, that's why I'm going to say my, my, my agent friend. Yeah. She has no clue. Yeah. She has to sell right. it to you. That's it. That's me. Yeah. That's the last thing. You guys, yeah. If you guys, have, if you guys have, ever find a new home project, I, we, we can all work together. We can always, I'll be happy to, I disclose everything about the numbers. And we'll, I'll make it fair for you, you know. So you ever provide me a lead or someone that you find that lady is like getting kicked out of their home? I can buy that home from them, give them some money, opposed to just hitting the rocks. Like a lot of times, I'll cash for keys, right? And I'll take over the space on for them, get them cleared up, but I get the home. It, I can help them, you know. I'm here to help. I'm not really. I'm not, my intent was never about the bottom dollar. Like I see all these other dealers in the area for. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I studied my competition. I know. I've been to the place. I've acted like I'm going home before I you know, became a dealer. You know, I, I did it. I never got a great feeling for them. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening. My name is again Graham Barlow with uh, Mobile Magic, uh, based out of Napa, but we do the entire state of California. Looking forward to hearing from you. Um, also, if you knew of any dealer questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Again, Graham Barlow. Thanks for watching.